welcome all the trainees all over the world for our youtube channel on urology exam preparation today we are going to conduct four mock exam scenarios on benign prostatic enlargement thank you for all the trainees who have joined for the first trainee your time starts now you have a 72 year old gentleman presented with urinary retention in a local district general hospital he was referred to you for further management how are you going to evaluate so i would see this patient in uh, my clinic i'll uh uh, 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 I would like to start with uh, 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 having an uh, IP uh, as, as a score filled uh, frequency volume chart as well. And um, uh, if he has a catheter at the moment, uh, uh, I'll start asking about, about the incidence of retention. Uh, uh, if it was uh, catheterized, uh, what was the residual volume? Was there any pain at that time? You know it's acute and uh, then i'll start asking about uh, the rest of uh question terms so if he has previous intact infection if he's uh, taken uh, medications any previous uh, surgical history any previous um uh, 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 uh comorbidities um, and also previous allergies um, then uh, i'll uh, proceed to examination that should be focused urological uh, examination chapter and including uh, abdomen, abdominal examination and cerebral area um, then in one scrotal examination if he has a catheter I'll pay attention if it's long-term catheter what's the size then I will proceed to digital rectal exam uh, paying attention to the anal tune and uh, prostate size and if, if there's any suspicion of the prostate then I will take it from there okay uh, history wise he is known to have hypertension on single drug well controlled he never had any previous episodes of um, like uh, urinary symptoms he had an episode of this retention after he went to a pub but had a couple of pints of beer and uh, as of now he is on a 16 french 2a catheter he is comfortable with that urine color is clear no focal neurological deficit Examine and wise, everything is insignificant except the prostate you felt to be more than 100 cc smooth. Uh, do we have any blood test from the previous hospital? Because um, I would like to arrange plus for him. I need to know if, if that was high pressure retention or low pressure retention. Okay, there was no blood from the previous hospital, but uh, he was told that his blood results were normal and uh, it seems like he had uh, catheterization and uh, syndrome on the same day and uh, you have arranged a new set of bloods today which were normal okay he has a, a prostate size of 100 cc prostate that's a, a quite large, a large prostate size so uh, i will cancel this patient uh, for uh, starting uh, uh, medical treatment and Try, I'm trying to have a trial without a caster after that to see if this is successful. Since he had an acute retention and he has very large prostate, we have a, a, a small chance that we'll, he will be able to pass a successful talk. And if he has if he has passed talk, uh, there's a high chance, 50%, that he will have another retention in a year time. But uh, it's worth uh, giving a trial to start him in medication and uh, combination therapy of uh, alpha blocker and 5-alpha um, reductase inhibitor and uh, give them a chance uh, to have a, a talk. That would be my primary approach. Okay. If that's, that's one of the options. If he's happy with the caster and he wants to have a long-term caster as a definitive uh, 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 plan, uh, I will uh, counsel about him about the caster that needs to be changed every three months and also the uh, possible side effects of, of the catheter in the future in terms of, in terms of infection, uh, difficult uh, change, bleeding, decreased blood uh, capacity, and risk of risk, risk of uh, uh, cancer to, uh, in the bladder as well. And uh, uh, take it from there. Okay, uh, he really wants to get rid of the catheter and uh, he's happy with your suggestion of taking tablets so he is going home with his tamsulosin and finasteride medications what is your next step 
So since he is heavy with the tablet, so we'll start him on the combination therapy. I'll arrange him to have uh, a talk clinic in two weeks' time. And uh, I will warn him about the about side effects of the tablet as well. And uh, see, him, um, see him after that. Uh, if he's a successful talk, he can only see him in three months' time with another IPS score and flow rate for arrival. If he failed a uh, talk and he has to be castrated one, once again, uh, I will see him uh, after that to discuss the other options of treatment. Okay, so after starting Tamsulosin, when are you going to arrange to walk for him? Uh, in a, in, in a, in from week to two weeks time. Okay, and um, unfortunately this gentleman failed the walk, so what is your plan? If he failed talk, probably he's with a caster now, so I'll see him again in, uh, in, in, in a month time and discuss with him the other option if he's still happy with the, uh, to have the catheter as a long-term plan or discuss surgical treatment in terms of uh, bladder outlet obstruction. Okay, so what type of surgeries you're going to discuss surgery, with him? Sorry. He has a very large prostate, so uh, he wouldn't be suitable for a conventional FTRP, so I will uh, discuss with him whole uh, uh, procedure. That's one of uh, option. Uh, if he want to preserve uh, if there is other also uh, novel therapy, which is the um, the uh, resume that can always be discussed with him, and the other option would be the uh, open prostatectomy, the minimum procedure. Okay. Is resume is indicated for somebody with uh, prostate hundred cc? It should be less than one hundred cc, but it's just borderline. So how are you going to counsel him? He really wants to have one procedure with catheter out 100%. So which is your choice? My choice for him, primary choice for him would be whole procedure. So uh, I will counsel him about the, the aim of the, the, the procedure itself, the aim of the procedure, trying to get rid of the catheter and try to take the excess of the prostate that obstructing him. Uh, that's the aim of the procedure. Uh, I will explain the procedure. It's, Itself. It's a, a laser uh, a prostatectomy inoculation of the prostate. Uh, it's uh, being done under general anesthetic, and uh, he will have a catheter for a day or so after the procedure. Then, uh, if the standard approach is to try to take the catheter out uh, after that, uh, the side effects uh, of the holip would be uh, uh, bleeding, which is less than the conventional TURP, risk of sepsis. Uh, is less than one, uh, one hundred one hundred one percent. There is always a risk of incontinence erectile. There is no risk of TUR syndrome, of course, because it's been done in in cellular line no, um, uh, pipe gland. Okay, your network is slightly poor. Just to make yourself comfortable and be closer to um, Wi-Fi hub. You are planning for HOLEP and um, after WHO checklist under anesthesia when you are doing the initial cystoscopy, he's got a large trilobar prostate with a good amount of median low and uh, you saw a stone measuring 3 centimeters in the bladder. Will it change your plan? So ideally, I would like to do two separate procedures because uh, uh, if there is a larger stone, so uh, it, it, it depends of if my estimation of the stone that should have been predicted pro or preoperatively and planned ahead. I will take into consideration that's uh, not part of the procedure. The uh, stone, if it, it can be cleared quickly, we can. Okay. Uh, and uh, not advisable in the setting of the expecting a uh, uh, bare area of the tissue. So uh, if, the, uh, if it's a small stone, I can almost clear it, I'll proceed with the holip. In the context of three centimeter stone, uh, I would like to be safe and clear the stone first, then come in another day and do the holip procedure. Okay, so how are you going to clear the stone? So, uh, in estimation of the stone, if it can be crushed with, uh, with the uh, with the stone punch, I'll try to do this. 
if it's large as three centimeter centimeter I can almost switch the to the nephroscope and using the uh, laser part bar I can also try to uh, uh, to uh, uh, break the soon okay. then I'll, uh, then remove remove it with the elec okay you said it's uh, preferable if we found the stone in the preoperative okay we'll stop there okay well done so how do you think you did any you changes you want to sh show yeah maybe with the Euro maybe with the resume should have said mm -hmm. shouldn't be done with, with a very high very large percentage yeah um, I, I will say that um, you are still safe uh, communication I'm not able to comment well uh, you are a little bit slow and hesitant in talking I want the the answers to come out quite very very sharp and hard on the examiner uh, even your correct answers uh, it creates a kind of a small sensation in the examiner is he talking with confidence or is he just trying to say what he knows so please be very clear and then speak with a lot of authority the answers which you know you should literally break the table but if you don't know of course just calm down and then modulate your voice and then your uh, wi-fi is quite poor Possibly, I, that's why I can't comment much on the communication. And um, otherwise, you have taken the evaluation in a very smooth manner, except for the fact I will at least arrange an ultrasound to know is there any upper tract changes, presence of kidneys that may have picked your stone, so that may have may not be changing the patient's treatment pathway clearly, but it will help you to evaluate better so that you can plan your theater schedule or you can even explain to the patient it will be a staged procedure and treat the stone first and do hold up next time, something like that. And uh, benign prostatic enlargement and prostate cancer are the two tables where the trainees will be expected to bring in as much of the articles or evidences whatever you have not tried anything uh, so please be very mindful and try to bring in something if you can't bring anything at least eau guidelines 2021 or nice guidelines uh, um, say 2014 something you need to bring in uh, a very good study for uh, starting alpha blockers and then taking a patient for twoc is al4 study which was done with alfuzuzin the patient's twoc happened 24 to 48 hours so your plan to have to walk for two weeks uh, has really no evidence to that we can talk the patient within 48 hours or, or at the 48 hours like second day and uh, when you are discussing the initial uh, retention treatment and you said there is a 50 percent chance patient may have uh, further retention those values have to be substantiated I will be asking this only in benign prostatic enlargement and prostate cancer. Any values you say it's nice to substantiate with uh, articles or guidelines or studies. And um, when you initially decide for the treatment for the patient with acute urinary retention, you have given him the option of long term catheter, you have given him the option of um, alpha blockers. I accept the combination of finasteride, nothing wrong in it, and um, trial void without catheter. At that point itself, you should give him a kind of a, a preface on possible surgical options if the retention fails. Because you haven't given that. You said only TWOC and uh, long term catheter. And then when patient fail TWOC and come back to you, you are discussing surgery. It's, it's every opportunity is important. You should feed the patient with appropriate news so that next appointment, you don't have to do anything from the scratch. You can just build on whatever you said already and uh, bounce information leaflets and uh, make sure that you are mentioning I don't think you will complete any table without mentioning bounce information leaflet whether it's for TURP or HOLAP or any procedures I, even if you plan for Eurodynamics it has the same value and then um, I personally feel when you are deciding a patient to go for TWOC a fit patient UN is okay and uh, no concerns like high pressure chronic retention uh, I choose flip flow valve it is a good method to make sure that the patient's bladder is maintained in the cycling so the patient will be having a feeling of at least uh, getting up at least once in the night or in the daytime he can open the catheter and pass urine that will be very useful i, I don't think there is any big evidence statistically to prove that the flip flow valve will increase your talk successness but um, at least it gives a less acid to the patient and patient's bladder will get uh, keep on cycling that's very important 
especially if you're listing a patient for holep, if you have long-term catheter with a leg back, if you're listing for holep, patient comes after six months, that's more than enough to spoil the bladder's physiology and then patient will struggle a lot. So keep in mind flip flow catheters whenever you are expecting a patient to have talk or even for surgeries, uh, provided the renal parameters are fine. Don't bring, resume, urolift, itend any minimally invasive procedures if the patient's uh, prostate is 100 or more than 100. Um, not necessary. You can bring monopolar TURP, bipolar TURP. That's what we have done for decades. So this patient, monopolar TURP, bipolar TURP, I, will, I won't say whole up, I will say anatomical endoscopic enucleation of prostate with various laser sources, whether it's holmium or thulium, doesn't matter. Or even a monopolar can be used, bipolar can be used as an energy source for anatomical endoscopic enucleation of the prostate. And uh, don't forget the last two choices of uh, open prostatectomy and robotic assisted simple prostatectomy. You said open prostatectomy, I appreciate it. And then um, size estimation is only approximate. Any prostate, once it crosses 80 cc or 100 cc, your estimation will be very, very false. So at least that is another indication to do at least an ultrasound. A trans-abdominal ultrasound is a good to estimate the size. It will tell you about the median lobe and you may have picked up the stone also. When you want to do a stone with holmium enucleation, for example, in this patient, uh, I don't think stone punch is a very good option. You got a quite large trilobar prostate. By passing the stone punch, you will create good amount of friction in the prostatic uh, path, which can cause uh, bleeding and obscuring the vision. And then um, in the bladder also, stone punch will create uh, ecchymosis in the bladder wall. The chances of small bladder mucosal injury is high. So if you have a wonderful equipment in your hand, uh, I will say, as you said, use a nephroscope, go inside, treat the stone. Sometimes the stone may be very crumbling and uh, you may be finishing the stone within 15-20 minutes. Who knows? And then you can do um, holmium enucleation either in a staged manner or like a triloba technique or like a um, you can do the stone and median and one lobe first, place a catheter, bring the patient after 48 hours and then do the other lobe and then clear the prostatic lobes by mass relation in the second sitting. So first sitting, stone dusting and clearing and enucleation of median and one side, whichever you preference. And second sitting in 48 hours, you can enucleate the opposite remaining prostate and then you can do the mass relation. So that will be a nicely evenly placed two-stage surgery. There is a good evidence to say that if you enucleate the prostate, place it in the bladder and come back in 24 to 48 hours, it will shrink and you will save a lot of time in mass relation for large prostates. Like if you're enucleating 200, 300 cc prostate, that's a good choice. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, can we start the second scenario? Second trainee ready? Yes, Mr. Parashik. I'm ready. Good. I will start your time now. Okay, your time starts now. You have a 60 year old gentleman presented with history of difficulty in passing urine and also on questioning he has erectile dysfunction. How are you going to evaluate him? Um, so uh, I'll review this patient in my dedicated lots clinic, ideally with the results of his urine analysis, uh, three day bladder diary, uh, flow rate and post void residue uh, observations and BMI. Uh, I will go ahead to take relevant history, including uh, sorry, including uh, history of detailed history of um, his voiding and storage lots, uh, any uh, red flag symptoms such as uh, hematuria or pain abdomen, uh, further detailed history of his erectile dysfunction using uh, preferably an uh, using an IEF uh, score uh, questionnaire. Uh, I'll go ahead uh, and take some history about uh, uh, his current drug use, including uh, smoking, alcohol. Uh, his current his comorbidities, uh, including uh, past medical history and allergies. Uh, I'll take specific history about um, uh, any prior urological procedures. Uh, I'll take uh, I'll also take family history of um, uh, uh, of, of similar complaints and uh, uh, take history of his ethnicity and current occupation. Uh, I'll I'll proceed to examination in the presence of a chaperone. Uh, 
after taking verbal consent and ensuring privacy, uh, wherein I'll do a general examination. Uh, what do you have? I have, I have his body mass index. I will assess his ASN performance status. Um, in general examination, I'm looking for any signs of renal failure. Uh, abdominal, abdominal examination will include suprapubic uh, uh, dullness to look for palpable blood and flank tenderness. Uh, then I'll proceed to gen examination of the genitalia, wherein I'm looking specifically for any metal stenosis. Uh, further, I'll do a digital rectal examination, where I'll look for the anal tone, uh, size of the prostate, and uh, see if it's benign or, or feels malignant. Uh, that will uh, conclude my examination, and then I'll proceed to uh, further investigations, wherein I'll be looking for his urine microscopy and culture. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he's 60, so I'll also get his PSA done, and further investigations will be guided by the findings of my examination and um, the information I've attained until now. Why do you want to do urine culture? Uh, no, I, I would do it only if uh, there is any specific indication such as dysuria in his uh, in his in his uh, in, in the history. Okay, so he's quite fit, performance status zero, and uh, he's known diabetic on single drug. Examination is non-contributory. His prostate feels like 40 cc smooth. There is no signs of any neurological problems. Urine dipstick normal. So how are you going to tackle him? His IPS score is 19 out of 25 and IAEF score is 10 out of 25. Right, so uh, now, uh, according to his IPSS score, he has uh, uh, moderate uh, LUTs and his uh, IIF, IFEF score shows that he has mild ED. Uh, so I will, uh, now he has diabetes, I'll check if his diabetes is well controlled uh, as that can contribute to his ED. Now, for uh, IPSS score of 19 and 25, he will, uh, I, I will still like to do a uroflometry and post word rescue before uh, considering prescribing any medications for him. I'll definitely ask him, uh, I'll review his diet and uh, fluid history and ask him to uh, modulate his, uh, 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 start conservative measures initially, which will mean uh, reducing weight, uh, physical exercise, um, uh, control of his comorbidities, stopping smoking, and reducing, his, uh, reducing the amount of caffeine in his diet. Okay, and um, he's happy, he said he's not drinking much of coffee, he's not a smoker anyway, so he wants to proceed further. His Europhlometry shows a obstructive pattern with a maximum flow of 9 ml per second and uh, water volume 400 ml with residual urine 135 ml. So, uh, uh, since he has a flow rate of less than 10, uh, then there is a significant chance of uh, around 70% uh, that uh, this patient is obstructed. Um, so, uh, also considering the fact that he has mild erectile dysfunction, I will start him on uh, tamsulosin, 400 micrograms ODHS. Uh, I will explain to him that um, uh, the, the side effects of tamsulosin, although his prostate is 40 cc, I'm not going to start him on finasteride because he already has erectile dysfunction. And around 6% uh, to 10% of patients with von finasteride can develop uh, can develop ED. Uh, for the ED, I will uh, uh, I will discuss with him the option of uh, starting tadalafil, uh, uh, five milligrams, uh, on a PRN basis uh, to be taken one hour before um, uh, he, before his uh, before he has intercourse. Uh, uh, I will explain the side effects. Make sure that he's not on any other medicines that are contraindicated. While he's on, uh, while he's having uh, tadalafil, uh, I will also explain to him that uh, with uh, tamsulosin, he can expect an improvement of 15 to 30 uh, percent in his uh, flow and around a similar improvement of around 30 percent in his IPSS score as well. Okay, how are you going to explain the side effects of tamsulosin to him? So uh, I will explain the side effects of uh, tamsulosin when I'll say that. Um, he has 1% chance of getting dizziness, 1% chance of getting postural hypotension, around 8% chance of losing uh, ejaculatory function, which will be either because of uh, retrograde ejaculation or an ejaculation. Uh, apart from that, uh, around 2-3% chance that he gets some uh, headache. Uh, I will also, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so th these are the common side effects of tapsilocin. Okay, he's quite worried about his uh, an ejaculation. How are you going to counsel him? Uh, so I will explain to him that uh, the anejaculation will not 
uh, affect his orgasmic function. However, if uh, he's uh, very keen on retaining his ejaculatory function, uh, then uh, I believe tamsulosin may not be the right choice for him. If he's not willing to accept that 8% uh, risk of an ejaculation, uh, then I will start counseling him for other forms. Now, he's already got ED, so I can't give him... So finasteride is probably not the best option for him. I will counsel him about the minimally invasive uh, surgical options uh, for him, which will retain the function of the bladder neck, specifically Eurolift in this case, as uh, Eurolift has been approved by the NICE. Um, uh, by the NICE. Uh, and he's young and he wants to retain his sexual function, so I can offer Eurolift. He has a small prostate. Before doing so, I will make sure that he doesn't have a median load. Uh, so Eurolift is one of the options that I will discuss with him. Okay. Why tamsulosin causes an ejaculation? Uh, so, uh, the earlier theory was that tamsulosin causes relaxation of the bladder neck by inhibiting the alpha 1A receptors there, which, uh, which so instead of uh, the semen being propulsed forwards, it goes back into the bladder. However, nowadays it is uh, said that uh, because of the inhibition of the alpha, uh, the alpha receptors, it actually uh, uh, doesn't cause semen to be propulsed into the uh, urethra rather than uh, it going back into the bladder neck. Okay. Why do you say Eurolift is not suitable for a patient with median low? So Eurolift works by uh, applying sutures on the lateral lobes, which pushes the lateral lobes laterally, uh, and th thereby it opens some space in the middle of the, uh, in, in, in the lumen of the prostate. Uh, it doesn't, uh, th there's no mechanism to push the median lobe into the bladder. The, uh, so that is why Eurolift doesn't work well with patients who have, who have a, a median lobe hypertrophy. Okay, so you have explained these things to him. What is your next step? Patient says, doctor, it's your choice. Please take me through. So uh, I will suggest that he should, uh, I will counsel him that he could uh, try a course of tamsulosin. Uh, an ejaculation is not uh, a permanent side effect and uh, see if his urinary function improves with just tamsulosin. If he does get uh, an ejaculation, then obviously we can stop the tamsulosin and consider uh, uh, to consider Eurolift. Okay. What is the role of Tadalafil in male LUTS treatment? So, uh, as per NICE guidelines, any patient uh, should not be given uh, Tadalafil just for LUTs unless and until he has got uh, concomitant uh, ED. Uh, this is as per the NICE guidelines uh, for LUTs in 2014. Um, yeah, that's it. Say, for example, this patient has coexistent ED. So, what is the dose? Uh, so, uh, now I can give him five milligrams on a daily dose because uh, uh, that is what uh, what the trials initially tried when when they were uh, when it was being tried concomitantly when it was being tried for uh, lower urinary tract uh, symptoms. The other option would be to give him ten milligrams on a PRN basis, wherein I'll ask him to take it. Um, uh, one hour before intercourse, I would prefer to give him the 10 milligram PRN dose. Okay. And um, unfortunately, you are seeing this patient. Sorry. I think the time is stopped now. Okay. We'll stop here. How do you think you did? Thank you, sir. I couldn't bring in many trials. I forgot the names of the trials of Tadalafil and, and Tamsulosin. And I should have mentioned uh, that Tamsulosin, uh, the, the improvement in function is based on the Findings of, but I, I think it's MTOPS, but I'll have to confirm whether. No, but Tamsulosin was combat, not MTOPS. Uh, so I should have probably said uh, that it was shown by the combat trial. Yeah. Uh, you, you can bring in combat trial, but uh, you can even mention MTOP trial to make okay. use of the trial to express that you know that MTOP trial, you know that they haven't used Tamsulosin. And you can mention the alpha blockers and 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, which is mentioned in which is used in both MTOP trial and combo trial. It's, it's a nice way to bring in, even though that may not be very optimal for your patient. So uh, just your yes. just taking a chance to bring in whatever you read. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Sure. Um, communication wise, no concerns. There is a good flow, good speed, and just maintain the same speed. I don't think you need to work on anything. Uh, the main things are you're not very strong in the role of Tadalafil in the erectile dysfunction because okay. in the starting itself you said you are going to prescribe a dose 5 milligram PRN. Okay. Oh, five, uh, okay. Uh, then you change it to 10 milligram PRN later and then yes. um, in a patient with uh, LUTS and 
erectile dysfunction there is a good role to start 5 mg tadalafil every day isn't it you said that but then yes. you finished the sentence by saying that but i will stick to 10 mg prn uh, 10 mg prn is is not a bad dose but you are not treating the male luts with the 10 mg prn isn't it yes yes and um, well, it, it, Yep. isn't that we don't use it anymore so i thought i um, i won't I say it, we can't use it anymore there are a lot of restrictions even in the place where i'm working there is a restriction uh, more at the level of gp level and uh, gps were advised oh. not to use 5 mg once a day as a choice for bph treatment because uh, patients try to abuse it by getting a lot of tadalafil etc but uh, as far as the nice guidelines are concerned 5 mg tadalafil once daily is an approved treatment for male uts with coexisting ed okay got got yeah. got and yes, two sir. more things uh, then anejaculation of tamsulosin you have explained the previous concept and tried to explain the newer concept the newer yeah. concept is it is due to a kind of atonicity of the ejaculatory duct the same oh. alpha receptors are blocked and so the ejaculatory ducts are quite nicely oh. distended and because of the atonicity there is no ejaculation that's why it is known as an ejaculation the previous oh. terminology retrograde ejaculation is a misnomer okay got it got it and uh, the last one for your take home is um, there is a mid lift study which has shown the efficiency of urolift for median low so i'm quite oh, yes. surprised why you discarded the urolift completely for median low you can say it's a challenging procedure you can say the outcome may not be equivalent to a proper turp in the presence of median oh. low but uh, the study is done by placing one clip to create a kind of uh, a, a channel or um, you can do a cystoscope and find which side the median lobe has got a nice groove and which side the median lobe is pliable to be uh, fixed and then say for example if it is the right side you can apply one clip to create a nice channel on the right side and then you could put one more clip to take the median lobe into the channel not all median lobes are amenable but few or can be done with urolift okay so i'll be more happy even if you said there are some new studies midlift mentioning or not mentioning uh, which proposes the urolift lol in the median low patients so uh, please don't discard completely because the the, oh. the scenarios are changing okay yes sir good sir can we go for the third trainee is it okay who is presenting next one yes I'm okay. okay, Mr. Mukherjee. Very good. So your time starts now. You are on call, and um, you are asked to see a patient in A and E. He is a 71-year-old, little bit frail gentleman with past history of uh, lobectomy for lung carcinoma. He presented with acute, painful urinary retention. How are you going to evaluate? I would see him in the A and E um, and um, make sure the patient is comfortable, not in pain. Um, uh, he said he's uh, in, in pain. I would take a short history, a focus history uh, regarding the episode, uh, how long he's been in retention, uh, whether he had any past history of uh, prostate problems or any other uh, blood outlet obstruction issues, uh, whether he uh, was catheterized in the past, whether he was taking any. Uh, treatment for his prostate enlargement and uh, any history of prostate cancer or uh, any other uh, radiotherapy to the lower limb. Um, any other investigations has been done in the past in terms of the uh, you, uh, the uh, a cystoscopy or any ultrasound scan. I'll go through that, um, and um, I would uh, do a focused examination. Um, especially to uh, look for his general condition and uh, his um, uh, hemodynamical stability i would examine his abdomen to confirm the uh, whether there's a palpable bladder i would also do a, a, a bladder scan to know the residual volume then without moving further i would uh, immediately catheterize the patient confirming that he is uh, he is in acute urinary retention i would pass a 16 french catheter and um, and know the residual volume and record it um once he is comfortable i would take some more information in the history whether he had any hematuria recurrent urinary tract infection any stone disease in the past and also i would like to know about his lung cancer status um, uh, how uh, what is the proposed treatment and all and in the examination at this point i would do a dre to see the uh, to estimate the size of the prostate and to make sure that uh, there is no uh, hard mass which is suggestive of prostate cancer 
Um, and uh, I would go through the investigation. Um, uh, by this time, after the catheter, I would, I would ask the nurse to do a urine dipstick, and if it is positive, I will send for urine culture. I would go through his uh, uh, blood reports and uh, especially the renal functions to see if there is any renal impairment in his electrolytes. Okay. At one point, you will do the urine dipstick for him. Um, upon passing the catheter, um, we can. Uh, we, uh, I would. I, I won't do immediately. Then, uh, once I know the uh, residual volume, um, then uh, uh, the, the next. W once I know the residual volume and once it's uh, it's it's discarded, then the next one I would do that. Okay. Please, I'm uh... sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I want to. I want to rephrase that. Yeah, I would do in the in the first urine sample that I get because uh, once the catheter is there, it will continuously drain. So we won't we won't have that for our okay. cap. Yeah. Okay. Um, he is quite thin built and frail, as he said. His bladder is palpable. You your bladder scan showed like more than thousand ml, and um, you catheterized him. He drained thousand four hundred ml of a light of blood tinged urine. Otherwise, he felt better after catheterization. Uh, any specific precautions you need to follow during a patient with more than a liter of retention? My worry here is whether he will go into um, post-obstructive diuresis. So I would ask the uh, a &E nursing team to uh, monitor his urine output for the next uh, two hours at least because I know the uh, if he passes more than 200 milliliter per hour for consecutive two hours after the obstruction is relieved, that is the definition of post-obstructive diuresis. So in that case, I have to make sure that the patient is hemodynamically stable and his electrolytes are monitored. Okay. His baseline blitz, which you sent, showed EGFR of 11. His normal EGFR done five years, six years back was normal at, uh, say, 90. And uh, he has a sodium of 125 and potassium of 6.2. And uh, he diurused 300 ml in the first hour. Okay, so um, this shows that uh, his potassium is high, uh, which needs to be addressed uh, uh, urgently. Um, at this time, I would send a, a VBG sample to confirm my potassium value, and I would take my a &E, uh, colleagues' um, uh, help in managing uh, potassium if needed. I would speak to the medical on-call team. Um, so he will be uh, taken uh, in ECG immediately to see, uh, to look for any hyperkalemic changes. And if the hyperkalemia is confirmed with ABG, uh, VBG, so the option would be to treat him with uh, insulin dextrose infection, uh, sorry, insulin dextrose uh, infusion immediately. If there are any ECG changes, he will also get calcium gluconate. That is my primary objective. Um, with this uh, impaired renal function and um, uh, his post voidal residual volume and then 300 milliliter in the first hour, he's more likely to get uh, a post obstructive diuresis. So uh, I, I, would, I would make sure that his vitals are monitored appropriately initially, at least half an hour for the next few hours. And then I would start uh, uh, fluid uh, replacement. I'm aware that his sodium is 125, so I would uh, myself, I would give a call to the, uh, the me medical on call register, get his advice uh, to have a controlled uh, fluid replacement for him. What are all the ECG changes you are expecting for him? Uh, tall T waves, uh, 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 mainly the tall T waves and um, uh, short QRS intervals. Okay, so let us assume that he's got ECG changes and on, on blood shows hyperkalemia even in the ABG. So how are you going to plan your insulin dextrose infusion? Um, so the uh, it, it, uh, uh, what happens in my trust, we, we have a, a protocol for this. So we'll initiate the hyperkalemia management protocol. So the insulin will be given uh, through an insulin pump. And uh, uh, I'm afraid I'm not exactly sure the dose, um, uh, but we go by the protocol, the, the trust protocol. Okay. Why insulin? How it works? Uh, it works in the receptor level when the insulin is taken uh, taken up by the cells. The uh, the, the, the potassium uh, potassium will all pota it will be coupled with the potassium, so the, the the potassium level in the plasma will be reduced. So that's the mechanism it works. What is the role for calcium gluconate? It will stabilize the cardiac muscles. Okay, how much you will give? 
10, 10 milliliter of calcium gluconate 10% over 10 minutes. Okay. So let us assume that this patient is stable over next three to four hours. What will be your fluid replacement plan? Um, the, ideally, the fluid replacement, I, I know there are different regimes. Uh, what I, I follow is to replace uh, two thirds of the previous hour urine output. So my advice for the nursing team would be uh, to uh, keep uh, hourly monitoring, uh, output monitoring and then replace two thirds of the previous hour output. So I will give a clear instruction to the nurses in my unit. They know what how we are managing. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they will do that. Uh, in this patient, I would tell him that he can take uh, as much as fluid as, as he wants and then uh, record it to, to see and I will adjust the IV fluids accordingly. Uh, the other, option, other management, um, <clears throat> would be here to have daily uh, monitoring of his uh, uh, renal functions and uh, hourly urine output uh, and then daily weight monitoring um, and uh, I would place him on a renal diet and also uh, I, I would uh, avoid any nephrotoxic drug in this patient. Okay, so this patient getting slowly stabled over the next 24 hours. His potassium is only marginally increased. It's much better than the previous 6.2. His sodium is normal. His EGFR improved to 25. So how are you going to further treat him, plan him? Uh, I would like to know his uh, urine output at this point. I want to make sure whether he is running into pathological uh, post-obstructive diuresis, please. He had diuresis for at least seven hours and then slowly the amount of urine per hour dropped down to 80 ml, 60 ml. So he is normal now in 24 hours. That's good. Yeah. So um, here we have a patient uh, with EGFR 25 Yes. So now um, I, I, I'm not inclined to discharge him now. Uh, I would continue to manage the hyperkalemia in consultation with the nephrology team. Uh, once that is stable, uh, and I, I assume that his EGFR will improve in the next few days, you know, next one or two days. So once the potassium is stable and the EGFR is uh, uh, improving, showing an improving trend, so I can discharge him with catheter, I'm not going to talk this gentleman because of the renal impairment. I also would like to have an ultrasound scan to see the upper tracts and any other abnormalities in the bladder, such as a stone. And uh, I would discuss him with the long-term management uh, that... Uh, I would tell him that chalk um, uh, uh, is not an option here. His his option would be uh, on a long-term catheter, either per urethra or suprapubic. I also would tell him that if he can, uh, if he can practice, or if someone can, can help him with a CIC, that is an option. Or else, if he is uh, fit for surgery, which I doubt, um, then I can go for uh, a QRP procedure, uh, depending on the uh, any any uh, inoculation of the prostate procedure, either QRP or a, a laser prostate surgery. Okay, we'll stop there. Good, how do you think you did? Uh, I did well, I should have brought certain things. Uh, I want to go for PA and all, I missed it. It's a good candidate. Uh, but um, about um, insulin dextrose, yeah, I, I missed it. Usually I actually don't do that, so mm. uh, I missed it. Yeah, so I, mean, I think I went in a methodical manner. Yeah, yeah, you you started very nice methodical manner. I agree with you, uh, but uh, the important thing is hyperkalemia is a kind of red flag sign, and uh, there are some things like uh, hyperkalemia. Examiner will be expecting in and out because you are a consultant, and uh, the main aim of the FRCS urology exam to see you are fit for uh, year one consultant. So what happens? Once you finish your FSS exam and taken up a year one consultant job and on the day your registrar is ST3 and your junior doctors don't know hyperkalemia treatment. So you can say that you will involve the renal team or medical team but hyperkalemia treatment you should know absolutely thorough. It's a, think it is a proper urology question. Don't think it is a non-urology question. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the best way to take the urine sample if you want to make sure that uh, to rule out infection is when you place the catheter, the first urine coming out, you can take it into two containers. You can do dipstick on one container and if there is anything positive, you can use other container for sending for MSU. That is the best way. Once you catheterize and connect the bag, then within few minutes, you will get colonization and you will never get appropriate urine sample for culture. But again, even the last trainee also said there is no need to send the urine culture if the urine dip is normal. So always say urine dip and urine culture only if it is significant. 
bladder are palpable gentlemen i'm not sure about the role of bladder scan because um, bladder scan will always show anything like 1000 once it is palpable it will be easily at least 800 to 1000 or more than 1000 most of the bladder scans don't have the fourth digit so it may say 999 above something like that so not very strong evidence to do bladder scan in a patient with acute retention with palpable bladder ECG again you need to be very confident in all the signs and uh, uh, symptoms what are going to look into the ECG and uh, fluid replacement I tend to replace maximum half of the hourly urine output and sometime even one by third um, I don't think two by third is really necessary especially who is really diuresing we will be really making him a fluid overload so two by third for a frail patient who has got a urine output of 300 ml which means you are giving an IV of 200 ml is really overkill and uh, you are correct in saying that patient should drink and eat as much normal that is a very good way of replacing but 2 by 3rd is, is really uh, overkill uh, you mentioned about the weight in a very passing manner uh, there is a specific protocol for high pressure chronic retention you didn't really spell out that this is a patient of high pressure chronic retention you should be quite clear in the diagnosis because the whole scenario revolves around hpcr uh, you don't have to even think about uh, pae and uh, by bringing pae maybe in the last few seconds you will get some brownie points but uh, the, the aim is mainly uh, HPCR so you should say the diagnosis I, I can understand you are discussing HPCR you said all the findings of hyperkalemia treatment post obstructive diuresis but I never heard uh, high pressure chronic retention in the whole 10 minutes so be clear once the history and examination is over I am dealing with the patient with high pressure chronic retention my concerns are hyperkalemia and post obstructive diuresis and then take it forward like that so be clear in saying the diagnosis uh, sometimes examiners won't notice but um, uh, not with me <laughs> and um, <laughs> the other thing is um, I once you say I pressure chronic tension you may easily get into the protocol so uh, there is a protocol of daily weight management you said weight measurement it's a, it's a daily weight measurement and charting that's very important sometimes you may have to do even twice daily if you are replacing so much of fluid and the most important is a blood pressure you should take blood pressure both in lying and sitting or standing position the orthostatic hypotension is a very good sign of the fluid balance so uh, be very strong and uh, this is a medical topic I agree but uh, fluid management electrolyte management HPCR you guys should be absolutely thorough the same scenario can come in emergency also if it comes in emergency they will just discuss hyperkalemia they won't even take you to how are you going to manage with the prostate Okay. okay okay yeah good can we go for the last training for the day yes thank you okay good. Um, you have a patient um, 28 year old presented with history of frequency of urination he is saying he passes urine like uh, 30 times in the daytime and four to five times in the night which is quite disturbing because he is going to college how are you going to treat him yeah, so uh, I will make arrangements to see him in the dedicated lower urinary tract symptoms clinic and uh, I would like to have a pre-arranged uh, frequency volume chart and um, when he comes to the clinic we have the setup to do a urinalysis and a flow rate and bladder scan study and I will also request him to fill the IPSS. So I will see him in the clinic with all these investigations. I will go through the history. Uh, to see if there is any bothersome, uh, uh, I mean, I know that there is uh, storage symptoms, so I'll ask for any associated uh, voiding symptoms. I'll ask for any, uh, how much it is affecting his quality of life, and uh, we'll ask for any uh, red flag symptoms like hematuria, loin pain, any weight loss. Uh, regarding the uh, medical history, whether he's on any regular medications, any uh, previous history of STIs, um, and uh, if in the surgical history, uh, whether the, he had any uh, surgical intervention uh, in, in the childhood, uh, any specific urological interventions, um, and in the uh, lifestyle history, I'll concentrate more on the life, lifestyle history, mainly to see his fluid intake, types of fluid intake, smoking history, any uh, illicit uh, uh, drug abuse, um, and his occupational history. 
this will be followed by uh, uh, family history of uh, to see if there is any family history of any significance uh, and uh, we'll go for the examination chaperone assisted general examination to see the uh, uh, bmi performance status um, look for any constitutional uh, symptoms like any peripheral edema uh, we'll do a focused uh, urological examination abdominal examination to feel for any masses any tenderness palpable external meatus to see if the uh, sorry penis to see if the if it, uh, force in can be retracted um, the local hygiene the external uh, meatus uh, palp palpation of urethra to see if the, i can feel for any uh, woody consistency uh, examination of testicles and i um, i know he is young 28 uh, but um, uh, i will convince him uh, the importance of having a dre Uh, and uh, if he allows then i will do it and then i will review his uh, i'll complete the uh, examination with a focused neurological examination this will be followed by the review of his urine analysis uh, ipss frequency volume chart flow rate and bladder scan study uh, so that will be my initial approach to him okay he has no previous history of any symptoms he has this urinary frequency both day and night for past 4 months he is working as a administrative assistant mostly at desk job he is a smoker he drinks alcohol socially examination wise bmi 20 thin build abdominal external genitalia and digital examination not significant his flow rate showed a good flow rate with a q max of 20 ml per second he voided 150 ml with no residue so um yeah uh, in this case uh, the my first uh, uh, option would be to see his um, uh, bladder diary so i want to see uh, the frequency of his urination and mainly to see the uh, functional bladder capacity the times that he passes urine at night so if he if he has got a bladder diary that will be really helpful for me and then also the ipss to see how much bother he Uh, uh, are the symptoms for him okay his ips score is like 31 out of 35 and quality of life is 6 out of 6 obviously is very anxious he is just ticking everything including the widening symptoms but on questioning further you are quite convinced it's more of storied symptoms and out of apprehension is given a quite high ips score before giving his <coughs> bladder diary what instructions you will tell him so i'll tell him that uh, he, uh, it has to be filled up in on three uh, consecutive days he has to follow his normal life pattern the fluid and he has to record the amount of fluid he takes the type of fluid he takes and uh, I, i'll tell him to buy a measurement jar from the chemist and then measure the amount of urine that he is passing and if there are any wet episodes he has to uh, record that as well there is a nice box urine input output chart available so i'll give him uh, that chart and there is nice instructions also on that box uh, information leaflet then it, it should be done for three consecutive days so what do you mean by the bladder diary and the frequency volume chart yeah so for a frequency volume chart we record only the amount uh, the frequency of uh, passing the urine and the volume uh, of uh, uh, passing the urine only so uh, but in the bladder diary it is a more extensive where we look for the type of the fluid intake and uh, uh, whether uh, there are any amount of uh, I'm sorry in the uh, incontinence episodes and uh, uh, the bother bo- some in the bo- botherness of the symptoms are also recorded in the ICIQ uh, bladder diary they have also provision to record the bladder sensations so compared to the frequency volume chart it is more extensive that can uh, give us more information about uh, uh, the bladder capacity and also the sensations as well okay what are you going to advise this gentleman to fill in bladder diary or frequency volume chart i will uh, uh, request him to fill up a bladder diary because his symptoms are profound and uh, uh, his young age so i would definitely want to uh, uh, see his functional bladder capacity and uh, uh, other details of the urinary symptoms so definitely a bladder diary for him okay his bladder diary shows no evidence of any incontinence he is passing approximately 15 to 18 times in the daytime 
and in the night time he gets up twice or thrice his uh, functional bladder capacity is 180 ml what other features you want to know from bladder diary so um Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I, I want to know the type of fluid that he's taking, whether he's taking lots of uh, caffeinated drinks and uh, also uh, the uh, input output. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I'll calculate that and also to see the whether he has got any uh, uh, polyuria symptoms. Okay. So uh, I have to calculate those from the blood of the Okay. How will you calculate the polyuria? So I can uh, in a 24-hour urine. Uh, uh, I, I'll first calculate the 24-hour uh, urine output, then I'll divide it into the daytime and the uh, night time. And according to ICI definition, the uh, nocturnal polyuria uh, is when a patient wakes up at uh, night uh, to pass urine and then go back to, uh, to to bed with intention to sleep. So uh, I, I will. Uh, uh, take all those definitions to consideration and then give the uh, index of the uh, daytime urine, uh, urinary volume and nighttime urinary volume and then we'll calculate the uh, poly, nocturnal polyuria index. Okay, now let us assume... And, oh, sorry, and one one more thing, if uh, I should also calculate the, whether there, there is any global polyuria which is uh, uh, defined as more than 40 uh, uh, ml per hour in a 24 hour period. So I can see whether he's taking lots of water, that's a contribution of his uh, frequency. Okay. There is no signs of global polyuria and uh, he doesn't seem to be suffering from nocturnal polyuria also. He has intake of uh, two to three cups of uh, caffeinated coffee throughout the day because of his administrative job. And uh, so how are you going to treat him? So first of all, I would advise him uh, lifestyle changes and bladder retraining. I'll give him the BOWS information leaflet on these uh, uh, procedures. I'll ask him to, um, uh, I mean, request him to stop his smoking, decrease the caffeinated drinks, uh, uh, adopt a healthy lifestyle. Uh, his BMI is normal. Uh, then I will uh, mainly concentrate on the bladder uh, train, train, training, sorry, bladder training, and we'll give the information leaflet on that. Okay, so how are you going to train him? What advice? So I will give, uh, I'll tell him to uh, try to postpone uh, the urination each time by uh, at least we can start like he can postpone, try to postpone it for 30 seconds, one minute and each time when he is successful, he can postpone that uh, uh, a, a bit more. Uh, so uh, in that way, uh, we can, we can, it, it's like a, uh, uh, we are re re relearning the uh, reflux mechanism of the bladder uh, because in uh, in childhood we just let the bladder. Uh, I mean, it's it's like the sorry, relearning the bladder pathways. Okay, so okay, you have taught him the bladder training. Uh, are you going to send him home or review him later? What's the next plan? Yeah, definitely. So because of his profound symptoms, I will be inclined to review him soon. I will make provision to see if, he, if I can. Okay, Sorry. we'll stop there. Um, how do you think Anish it went? Uh, no, not good. Um, no, I won't say it's not good. Maybe it's maybe something which you haven't expected possibly. Um, I purposefully yeah. selected the scenarios which were not commonly discussed and uh, there is a scenario of pure storage LUTS in men. Okay, so mm -hmm. don't get surprised if you get a scenario of pure only storage LUTS in men. The treatment is almost same, it's almost like how you do in a woman and uh, the same scenario can come even in pediatrics. Uh, it came to me, uh, uh, just a frequency of urination in a child, bladder training and um, you need to take the patient um, even up to like constipation treatment. Uh, now they call it as a bladder bowel elimination syndrome or bladder, previously it is known as dysfunctional elimination syndrome, now it is known as bladder bowel syndrome. That is more important for children. And uh, okay. for adult, um, I'm happy with the way by which you have taken. Maybe um, you are by habit having a small hesitation here and there. Maybe uh, when you hear the, the YouTube recordings, you can easily understand. So those hesitations you can try to overcome that will give you a little bit of smooth flow. 
and um, the things okay. like um, chap chaperon assisted examination but we don't usually assist it's more of like a presence of chaperon so few small things here and there be much more clear in bladder dairy because this scenario bladder dairy has got good weightage so sure. you can even say i will go for frequency volume chart because a young fit man present with frequency no incontinence so even that has a role not a bad choice but if you go for bladder dairy it's acceptable but you need to substantiate that i'm going for bladder dairy more extensive evaluation because of his profound ips score i need to keep an eye on his fluid intake etc nocturnal polyuria index is 33% so one by third of the urine or more than that if it comes in the night and uh, i was expecting you to explain how will you do that with bladder diary or frequency volume chart that uh, you are uh, any urine voided after the patient went to sleep is counted including the first void in the early morning purposeful waking not because of urine sensation purposeful waking and the first void is also included in the nocturnal polyuria index calculation very easy 1 by 3rd of the 24 hours or in percentage you can say 33% okay and um, yeah a little bit of stress on converting the um, stopping the decaffeinated drinks smoking and be careful with alcohol and uh, i wish you to have the time sensation so that you may have progressed to solifenacin i thought of Uh, expecting you to say solifenacin and uh, if it fails mirabegron it's almost like women and uh, so a little yeah. bit faster progression But, yeah yes uh, my question was whether i can uh, uh, i mean uh, i haven't gone to the guidelines for a male frequency I mean, male storage plates in such a young young age so uh, can we can we give medical treatment straight away or is it like lifestyle change review and then uh, if it's not improving and then medical treatment i agree with lifestyle changes first and then reviewing but uh, in in nhs mm-hmm. what's happening is you will give lifestyle changes and then see the patient in 3 months time isn't it um, even though okay. by nice guidelines you can say 6 weeks time you you can say that you can mm-hmm. say i will give lifestyle changes and review him in 6 weeks time as per the nice luts 2014 guidelines and then i will try to start okay. the medications in the 6 weeks time but you know truthfully in our practice it's difficult to see this benign patients in 6 weeks time and we end up seeing in 3 months time so how i will try to tailor my answer is i will give him this lifestyle changes i will strongly advise him not to take any medications and try this to the maximum for the first 4 to 6 weeks time and if it's not working i will ask the gp to start him on solifenacin 5 mg or 10 mg with the attendant side effects and uh, so i will review him in 3 months time so that i will know whether he is successful with lifestyle changes and also whether the solifenacin is acting or not this answer yeah, um, i mean both answers are good this answer will satisfy uh, examiner who is a practical person he will say okay this guy yeah, sure. is trying to implement what he learns in the daily practice that's very important so the whole yeah, marking perfect. is on communication knowledge and application of knowledge so by saying this you are taking the knowledge and also application of knowledge by just saying that i will give a uh, lifestyle changes review in 6 weeks time you are showing off your knowledge um application of knowledge in the daily practice especially in nhs it's not really matching isn't it and um, yeah, so that's true. yeah that's true. you need to show the application how are you going to apply it perfect and one more question because the nice guideline says that for patients with profound symptoms we can do cystoscopy so i was between because uh, on one side i thought he's young there are no compelling indication for cystoscopy but uh, were you expecting me to do a cystoscopy for him not really the same scenario no, okay. come in a patient 70 year old the same scenario exactly same frequency no voiding symptoms only urinary frequency mm-hmm. same ips score everything then there is an indication for cystoscopy because of possible cas or uh, flat t flat tcc something like that uh, so sure. no hematuria young patient there is no real reason to jump into cystoscopy because your dre is normal for this patient no cystoscopy the nice guideline storage luts mentioning about cystoscopy is to rule out cas and possible tcc which can present as storage symptoms that will be more prominent only in elderly men maybe with dipstick positive hematuria okay okay uh, can i ask thank you so much that yes yeah. um 
uh, first in the first case, uh, if someone presents with urine retention, will we, do we still uh, give IPSs to fill? Uh, not really. Um, yeah. Not not very okay. useful. Um, especially uh, if the patient said that he had no past history of LUTS, then there is no point in doing a, doing IPSs score. But if the patient says I'm suffering from um, urinary symptoms for the past one year, but unfortunately today I had retention, something like that. Then you can tell just uh, just ignore the retention and um, consider your symptoms before the retention episode. Can we have an approximate IPSS? There is a rule. But the scenario which I gave, I said patient had no previous LUTS. Okay. Yeah. And uh, tadalafil, um, do we prescribe only tadalafil when when there is um, both LUTS and uh, uh, erectile dysfunction, or is it with uh, we can, can we add with tansilosin? Uh, yeah, as per the NICE guidelines, tadalafil 5 mg is good for male LUTS uh, yeah. along with the coexisting erectile dysfunction. But in, in general practice, we try to give the tamsulosin along with that because it's more right. cheaper and uh, tamsulosin is the one probably patient may take for longer time. And uh, once the tadalafil kicks in and once he gets enough confidence in the sexual activity, the tadalafil will become a PR and 5 mg or 10 mg. 10 mg is the usual PR and dose. And um, so, yes, tamsulosin can be given coexistently. Okay, so we say that uh, we, we start on tamsulosin, we also add tadalafil, considering, or, um, I mean, 5 mg daily, considering his erectile dysfunction, isn't it? Yes, so, so you, can, you can say, like, uh, I will prescribe him tamsulosin, explain the side effects. If he's very concerned, and since he has pre existing erectile dysfunction with the scores in the IEF, I will also prescribe him tadalafil 5 mg to be taken once daily as per the NICE guidelines. I am aware we are doing double treatment for his LUTS and also treating his erectile dysfunction. But in three months time, we can tailor the medications and take it forward. Tadalafil can be converted into a PR in 10 mg or even 2 mg. And file for reductus inhibitors, is it always be avoid or can we still give because the percentage is only less than 10 percent, isn't it, erectile dysfunction. So in, a, in someone who, who, who is on a catheter. So do you think there's a role for file alpha reductase inhibitor? Can we completely ignore that? Yeah, uh, for a patient on a catheter, for a successful TWOC, file alpha reductase inhibitor is not going to help. It's a slow yeah. acting drug. It's not going to change the successfulness of the TWOC. And if the patient has prior erectile dysfunction, it's better to avoid file alpha reductase inhibitors. Uh, I don't prescribe. Tamsulose okay. in itself is enough to give him the symptoms. And um, sometimes they will really perform very poorly with tamsulosin and they may say, ah, we have discontinued tamsulosin and continuing only tadalafil 5 mg once daily. Okay, thank you. Good. Again, don't forget the basics. What is the uh, symptoms of tadalafil, back pain? And um, so don't think that, okay, this is an andrology. This is not an andrology discussion. This is a BPS discussion. You need to really put the coat of the andrology discussion and discuss that also. If it's hyperkalemia, you need to put the coat of the emergency scenario and then discuss that also. So uh, there is a small overlap here and there. Uh, we have discussed this BPH, this is sometime like third or fourth time, I think. So that's why yeah. I try to give you a mixture of high pressure chronic attention, uh, male with 1D storage LUTS, and then anatomical endoscopic enucleation of the prostate. So I try to mix match as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, that's so helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay guys. Thank you so much. This, are... is, this is one of the best sessions uh, I've attended. I feel because uh, I prepared with all the other PPH, but uh, yeah, I mean this is a good scenario. If it comes in exams, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, I think uh, I'll prepare more on this one. Thank you so much, Mr. Spencer. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, guys. Have a nice rest of the day. Speak to you all later. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.